I am Balaji, Professor in Mechanical Engineering. So, I just give a very brief overview of uh, Mechanical Engineering. The selling point is Mechanical Engineering is forever exciting. Okay. Yeah, next slide. So, what is Mechanical Engineering? So, a branch of engineering that applies the principles of science to analyze, design and manufacture machines, tools and mechanical systems. So, even if you look at the various things in this room, we can list out 100 things which are done by Mechanical Engineers. So it is true, wherever you go, there's mechanical engineering. It is very broad based. It is one of the oldest disciplines and it is frequently referred to as the ever, evergreen branch of engineering. Yes. The influence of mechanics can be found even at the time of Archimedes. You, you know the famous buoyancy principle. So it is known as early as 287 BC. Hero, as you all know, Hero developed the first, uh, world's first steam engine. So he lived between 10 and 70 AD. So mechanical engineering evolved as a separate branch in the 19th century. So one of the most important things which led to the de development of mechanical engineering was the steam engine. The steam engine was very critical for both the industrial revolution as well as for the development of technology. So if you look at this hero's helo pile, so some of you may be aware, is there a pointer? Oh, that is dangerous. Which one? Okay. It's not clear. Okay. So, if you look at the hero's helo pile, as you can see, there's water inside that spherical drum. So, it has got two uh, nozzles. So, if you apply heat, the water becomes steam, and then because of the action and reaction principle, it rotates. So, how, so this is uh, this probably was the first conceptual design of a steam engine. James Watt. Uh, you, all of you have studied that James Watt developed the steam engine, but unfortunately, it was not James Watt who developed the steam engine. Who developed the steam engine? Ah, no. No, it's not a hero. <laughs> so, the steam engine was developed by Thomas Newcomen. Okay. So, and uh, James Watt did some improvements, but however, we are now giving credit only to James Watt. You may all be surprised to know that the original steam engine was not used for locomotion. Right? It was not used in the train. Where was it used? Mining coal. Somebody says it is. It was used for mining coal. The answer is correct. Why do you want to mine coal? Huh? Why you have, have a complicated route for this? Previously, how were they getting coal? Okay, where was the steam engine invented? Which country? England. Fine. Agree. England. Okay. England they developed. Right. So, how do you think uh, before coal was there? What are the major source of fuel? Firewood and wood can also be converted to charcoal, correct? Using a uh, process. Now, uh, they were getting charcoal from wood. So, they could have continued to get charcoal from wood and be happy and never worry about the steam engine. Why endlessly invent some steam engine, make students study engineering and then mechanical engineering? Why all this? If they could have kept quiet, isn't it? No efficiency, no. Huh? You can get more charcoal. No, no, what is the problem? Charcoal comes from what? Wood. Those times we didn't have the plane. So if some, some country had to have military dominance, what, to, what was the most important thing they, they had to have? Apart from army, they used the navy. So which was used to make ships? Wood. So if the, all the wood was cut and, and was used to make charcoal, then they would they would lose the competitive England thought that they would lose the competitive advantage. Therefore, they wanted to preserve the wood. So they wanted to see if there, there, there could be some other alternative instead of charcoal. Then they found out that coal is available. But unfortunately, coal is available only deep inside. For that, the water has to be bailed out. So if we have to develop water, then human pumps and pumps driven by horses were not sufficient. Therefore, it was it was it was a necessity to invent the steam engine. Later on, it was an afterthought, and then they used the same steam engine to power the locomotive and the automobile and so on. You getting the point? So the original steam engine was used to pump water. Such a silly application, but it turned out to be that it was originally developed for pumping water, and later on it was used for locomotion. Yeah. So why why are we so hung up on the steam engine? Why is steam engine so critical? Any mechanical engineering professor, first class, come out and he will say steam engine, steam engine, steam engine. Nowadays we don't we don't use steam engine, right? We have got turbines and all that. This uh, 
The steam engine is so critical because of this reason. Engines produce mechanical work or the rate of power, rate of work, which is called power. So mechanical work reduces human toil. I have indicated in red color, right? It is capable of, it is like you can play God. I mean, mecha the mechanical work completely reduces human toil. What took so much of time and effort could be done very easily. Okay? That is why between heat and work, work is considered superior to heat. Because when you come, when you convert heat to work, you cannot convert it fully because you run it through an engine and there is an efficiency associated with this. Whereas if you take a thousand watt immersion heater, from the thousand watt electricity, electrical power, you can directly get thousand watts of heat. Okay? Therefore the story is, while work can be completely converted to heat, heat cannot be completely converted to work. This, this one line, that heat cannot be completed to work, when you do engineering, we will explain this in 45 hours in a course called thermodynamics. You are all laughing, say, I am also a teacher in thermodynamics. If some of you come with, so how we develop the story? Just like somebody talked about movies, right? There, most of the Indian movies have only one story. X wants to marry Y and somebody is not interested in that marriage and how the story evolves. <laughs> most of the Indian stories have only one line. So that, uh, right, that to somebody could be the girl's father, the girl's brother, the boy's father, it is like that. Here the story is, heat cannot be completely converted to work. So it's a big story, 45 hours, we, then you do work out problems and this, okay, if it cannot be completely to completely converted to work, how much can I convert? 60%, 70%, 80%? Are there some limitations associated with this? Is there a fundamental law of nature which forbids me from converting heat completely to work? Is there a law? There is a law. What is that law? law. That is the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics forbids you from transferring heat from a body at a lower temperature to a body at a higher temperature without the use of work. Okay? But your air conditioner and refrigerator constantly do that. But you are supplying additional power. Okay? What is the proof of the second law of thermodynamics? What is the proof of the second law of thermodynamics? The proof, the proof of the second law of thermodynamics is that it cannot be disproved. Okay? Yes, there is no formal proof of the second law. Each time you do an experiment, you come to the same conclusion that heat cannot be completely converted to work. There is no, just like there is no need to prove that God exists, so long as you are not able to prove that God does not exist. It is not mandatory. I think you will all sleep off if we go on. <laughs> okay? So, so to make matter simple, mechanical work reduces human toil. I mean, there is no need for some explain, more explanation on this. It is granted. So the original steam engine was not used for locomotion, but, but for pumping water. Yeah. No, mechanical, mechanical engineering today it is all pervading, omnipresent. It is present everywhere. Modern cars, from the cheapest Tata Nano to BMW, Benz, Audi. All these cars are now, you can see on Chennai roads. Audi 6, 7, whatever series, BMW, whatever series you name, everything is there. Power plants, your diesel gen generator set, coal-based thermal power plants, nuclear power plants, <laughs> combined cycle power plants, robotics, artificial intelligence. Some of you will see the robotics lab today. He doesn't like me. <laughs> the, the, mo the most powerful machine tools that can cut and machine literally anything. Okay. Now, continue. Design and manufacture very advanced machines like the computer numerical control lathe, where it's everything is computerized. Right, nanotechnology, you hear, you hear so, mo so much about it. Very low temperature science, okay, where you make liquid, liquid nitrogen and so on. That low temperature science is called cryogenics. Right, design and manufacture of advanced pumps, turbines, compressors, development of new energy technologies like solar, wind, fuel cells, tidal and micro -hydal. Now, the world's largest gas turbines are powering what? World's largest power, gas turbine power plants are powering the aircraft. The Boeing, the Boeing 777, the Boeing 777 has got only two engines. It can fly non-stop for 16 hours. It can fly non-stop for 16 hours with just two engines. Right? Previously, the Boeing 747, 400 used to have four engines. Now, with two engines, we are able to do that. Right? So, the list is almost endless. I want to classify mechanical engineering. There are several classifications. Uh, this is a broad classification. It is kind of universally accepted. Mechanical engineering can be broadly classified into three streams. One is the design stream, one is the manufacturing stream, and one is the thermal engineering stream. In the thermal engineering stream, we look at energy conversion. How to convert heat to work. When you have a heat engine, what are the various processes, what are the various kinds of equipment you have to design and build in order to accomplish this conversion of heat to work and so on. And then how do you build your refrigerators, air conditioners, power plants, 
automobiles and automobile engines and so on. That is thermal engineering. Design, again. <laughs> De no, you're going. Ah. Design. So you want to design first be before you make the car. You have to design it and do and do analysis and find out whether there are stresses. What is, what is the kind of stress distribution on the car and whether it can survive a crash test and all that and what are the materials which have to use, which have to be used and so on. Then manufacturing. How do you come out with tools and machines which will eventually make this? So design, manufacturing, and uh, thermal engineering are the three broad sub disciplines of mechanical engineering. So uh, so I can take. Uh, so there are various ways in which I can proceed from now. I deemed it fit to take two examples. Uh, first is the automobile and uh, then the satellite launch vehicle. And then we will see how mechanical engineering comes into play through these two examples. So the original car, original car was developed by Benz. So it is from, uh, the automobile came from uh, Germany. So if you look at the original car, it looks like what? It looks like our cycle, the familiar cycle rickshaw, right? And then the automobile of the 20s, then the automobile of the 50s, and the, the last one is the Ford Fusion Hybrid. Okay, the last one, the black car is the Ford Fusion Hybrid, which I have, which I have put there. So if you can see, what are the improvements you can see? Tires. Very good, tires. Now we have got tires with tubes. And then, what, what else can you see in the wheels? Okay, first point is tire. No, 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 no. Hang on, hang on to tires. Spokes, spokes went off. Then you have got tubes. Alloy wheels. Alloy wheels, then. Then the size of the tire. No, no. <laughs> Stick to the Stick to the tire now. Tubeless tires. No, no, why are you jumping? Wait, wait. So tires there's so much. Then Okay, then look at the body. The, the original AD. 1886, the body was mainly con made of wood. Wood. Now it is lot of aluminium. Lot of aluminium. Even the engine is aluminium. Okay. Now look at the size of the engine for the 1886 car and the modern car. Even this 1950 also, the front part is mostly the engine. So the engine has become critical because people want more speed, more control, everything. Then there are no mirrors. Now you got mirrors, right? Side view mirrors. Then. What else? Headlights. Headlights, parking lights, central locking system, DVD player. <laughs> okay, ABS. What is ABS? Okay. So what does it do? It helps you to prevent skidding, right? When you're when you're taking a sharp turn, when you're over speeding. Is that enough? Shall we proceed to the next slide or you want to? You want more? Okay, you keep telling. GPS. <laughs> GPS, then. Huh? More accidents. If you look at more accidents, but if you look at the number of vehicles, the number of accidents, number of vehicles, I don't know whether the ratio has gone up or not. Okay? So, do you believe that mechanical engineering is growing at such a fantastic pace? Yes. <laughs> Legs are the brake. <laughs> See, he he is asking. Oh, you are all laughing. He is he is asking, sir, whether the original one had brakes. Okay, I said probably probably the legs could have had brakes. Nowadays, you, see, when you are driving, somebody will cross the road. You do like this. So he tells me that your brake is in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> He will simply shh. Then I have to do this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm. Now you have to clap. Tata Nano. Come on. Uh. Okay. So if you go to if you go to Google Wikipedia and look at the automobile, so the Tata Nano is Tata Nano's picture is there. Just as you had the Benz original 1886 car. So the Tata is a major innovation, is, is a, one of the major things which has happened to car, cars because the Tata Nano is probably 1.25 lakhs or whatever base version. 
for, for don't worry about stories of Tata Nano going up in flames and all that. That is the only a few cars. But it uh, meets all the European emission norms, all the Indian emission norms. It meets all the crash tests. It costs less than 1.25 lakh. Now look at the other one. That's a sports car. Okay, one of the world's most expensive cars. Uh, power is about 700 to 800 horsepower. But what is the ultimate car? Bugatti Veyron. You want to see that? Yes. Next slide. No. Go, go further. Go further. Go further. Further, further, further. Cost one million. Ah. Okay, so the Bugatti Veyron, the Bugatti Veyron is the, the world's ultimate car. So, Bugatti Veyron is an Italian sports car, but top speed is 400 kilometers per hour. The power is 1000 horsepower. So, it is the power of 1000 horses. Somehow, for some reason, we have the original FPS, the British system of power, used in was used in multiplication of number of horses. Right? But which horse? <laughs> There is a problem, right? And I have so 96.8, 96.98.6 point, degrees Fahrenheit we should be the uh, normal body temperature of who? No, you, if <laughs> of a horse. <laughs> no, 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 don't connect all these stories. So that is one more example. Okay, so all this, so these standards are all arbitrary. So even if you put a thermometer now, there will be a variation. Maybe the average may be 98.4. So 98, so 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is the average body temperature of a British male who doesn't have fever. That is the original definition. Why only British male? Why not an African female or African male? So now also these are so. So you are all laughing and all that, but it leads to it leads us to a very important concept called we need to have standards. We need to have standards in the measurements of various quantities. Standards in terms of mass, length, time. And then the International Conference on Weights and Measures, they met and decided that something will be kept somewhere and everybody has to follow that. From that, national standards will ever evolve. From national standards, regional standards will evolve and so on. Okay? Now, let's go back. Now, what's, what's new in cars? This is the Toyota Prius. It's a hybrid car. Toyota Prius is available for sale even in India. It's very expensive, but so hybrid car is one that can be powered by electric power and petrol or diesel. So it is one of the world's most successful cars. It is also one of the cleanest cars in the world. At the at the same time, one of the most fuel efficient. It can give you an incredible fuel efficiency of 30 kilometers per liter. Yeah, I think if it gives that, it, we should be happy. But that is only for crazy people, right? <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> What is this hybrid car principle? For when you are frequently starting and stopping in city traffic, the electric power takes over. The regenerative braking, when you are braking, that power, the power, the excess power can be used for charging the batteries. At cruise, excess power produced by the petrol engine charges the batteries. On the highway, only the petrol engine works. So, incredible fuel efficiencies and low carbon emissions. Of course, the internal combustion engine speed, IC engine people are also catching up. They are saying that we can try to do all this by using the petrol engine itself. There is no need for the hybrid because the hybrid is additional investment and added extra weight and all that. But the Toyota Prius in US now I think has a waiting time between 3 months to uh, 6 months. It costs about 20, 25 to 28 thousand dollars. Okay. We have already seen the ultimate car. So, Second example. Let us look at a second example where we are looking at an inter interdisciplinary science namely the interface of mechanical and aerospace engineering. So, satellite launch. So, you know that you, if you want to put a satellite in orbit, you you need a launch vehicle. Okay? The launch vehicle is usually a launch vehicle is usually a rocket. A rocket is required that can give high velocities. What is this rocket principle? A rocket pushes itself forward by continuously ejecting out material. Rocket is quite different from a cannonball, from a cannonball in the barrel of a gun or a bullet which leaves the bullet which leaves the pistol because it constantly ejects mass, its mass keeps reducing and it accelerates further and further. Because if you want something to escape out of the earth's gravitational field, you have to give escape velocity which is equal to? Yeah. 0.2 meters per second? Yeah. Wow, 1.2 kilometers per second but that varies at various heights, right? Now, so a rocket is essentially a self-propelling vehicle. 
How do we provide such high velocities? We have multi-stage rockets, okay? At every stage, a certain portion is ejected off, its mass reduces, and then it accelerates further and further. To place a satellite in a geostationary orbit, I'll quickly tell you what I'll, in a minute, I'll tell you what a geostationary orbit is. We require an energy which corresponds to a change in velocity of 11 kilometers per second, <coughs> which is a very huge number. We do this stage by stage by using a multi-stage rocket. There's no use providing this energy at the surface of the Earth because of the friction, much of it will be killed. Therefore, you increase it after it leaves the Earth's atmosphere. Okay. Geosynchronous orbit. What is a geosynchronous orbit? When the radius, when the radius is 42,164 kilometer, an object rotates, if it rotates from west to east like the Earth, then its movement is synchronous with that of the Earth. Then it appears stationary. Then it's possible for, it's possible for us to locate images. For example, if the satellite is launched by Indian Space Research Organization, we can ensure that it always looks at India so that we can look at the weather, we can look at other things in detail. This is called a geostationary or a geosynchronous orbit. So the radius of the Earth is 6378 kilometers. So the radius of the orbit will be 42,164. So the geosynchronous altitude is about 35,786 kilometers above the Earth. So imagine the satellite has to put something in an orbit which is, a, which is at a height of 36,000 kilometers. Okay, so we use it using the GSLV, the Geostationary Satellite Launch Vehicle, with which India has not had complete success. We have had mixed, mixed success. Okay, however, it is possible for us to put a satellite into orbit at a lower height. That is called a LEO, low, low Earth Orbit. But the problem with the low Earth Orbit is two things. Basically, since it is not synchronous with the rotation of the Earth, this, you cannot look at the same place 24 hours a day. So it will look at various portions of the Earth, Okay, in a, in a particular day. And second, because it's 700 kilometers, we cannot say that there's no atmosphere at all. There will be a drag force and eventually it will try to come closer and closer to the Earth. Therefore, we have to fire rockets and push the orbit up higher and higher. Okay? If you put a satellite in a geostationary orbit at 36,000 kilometers, then there is a finite life to the, there is a finite life to the equipment on board. Suppose, let's say the mission life is five years or seven years and so on. After that, what do you do? Theoretically, the satellite will keep going around, but we will not get any useful thing because all the cameras, other things, the solar cell, all the other things have all gone kaput, they are all gone. So what do you do now? You give a missed call and ask it to come back or what do you do? <laughs> huh? Very difficult to make it fall, man. Simply it will, simply it will keep rotating. Okay? What you do is, what you do is you have some law, you have some one or two additional rocket thrusters. Then from 36,000 kilometer, you push it out to 45,000 or 50,000 kilometers so that it is not in the path of other, other useful satellites which are operating at 36,000 kilometers. So if you push it to a height of 45,000 or 50,000 kilometers, you're essentially putting this into what is called a graveyard orbit. So that is the all the fellows who have finished their life, they'll all be moving around in that altitude. So that this 36,000 kilometer altitude, it is free for satellites which are operational to go around, okay? So this is a big story. I can talk to you about this for one, uh, orbital mechanics for one or two hours, okay? Multi-stage rocket, so you do it in stages so that you are able to accomplish. So medium payloads, 1,000 kgs to geosynchronous transfer orbit, that is GTO, 3,000 kgs to a low Earth orbit. So the Indian space program, the PSLV, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, which can launch satellites into the low Earth orbit, which I told you, which can be typically uh, 300 to 1,000 kilometers height. Uh, we had uh, very good success. The Chandrayaan was also, the Chandrayaan was also launched using a PSLV XL. Yeah, so now, next slide. Now, if you want to put something into geostationary or a geosynchronous transfer orbit, you have to use a heavy, there's a heavy payload of 2,000 to 2,500 kilogram. Therefore, you have to use the geo GSLV, the Geostationary Satellite Launch Vehicle. So, India has had seven launches so far. So, three launches have been failures. The last launch on 25th Christmas Day, 25th December 2010 was also a failure. So, people are working out, but I think we will eventually succeed, right? Has somebody explained to you about this? No. I, I have, I will close. <laughs> okay, so the PSLV, the, so the PSLV launched it and put it into a geo, uh, geosynchronous transfer orbit GTO. Then what happens is, so it is an elliptical orbit. So it is an once it reaches here, what you can do is you can fire some more rockets and push the orbit further. 
then this is called orbit raising or orbit pushing. So you keep on pushing the orbit, then you can increase this and its height will increase but it will be elliptical. At some portion it will be very close to the earth, at some portion it will be 30, 40,000 because the moon is at some 2,75,000 kilometers, right? So once it, has, once it has reached a particular position, then it starts what is called the translunar injection. That, that is, it, you fire it in a way such that it approaches the moon, then it now goes into the, now it starts orbiting around the moon, then what you do is you slowly reduce the orbit such that from thousands of kilometers it comes very near and when it comes very near, the, very close to the moon, then you launch your MIP. That is the, what is MIP? The moon impact probe. Then what is the major, what is the major scientific, uh, uh, major scientific output of the Chandrayaan? Water. Water is there on the moon. That is accepted even by NASA. Okay. Yeah. So what do we do with satellites? So once the launch vehicle puts it in, puts the satellite in space, we can do Earth observations, study characteristics of other planets, communications, military applications, weather, navigation, and so on. So we'll. So these are the Indian weather satellites which have been launched. Yeah, this is the website of the India Meteorological Department. You can go and you can see that a lot of improvements are taking place. This is a typical picture. Somebody already, Professor Krishnamurti already talked to you about this. So there are various, you have visible image, you have got infrared image, you have got microwave image and so on. Quickly, the visible image, the problem is it's available only between 6 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening. If you want to have, if you want to know how the clouds are evolving in the night, you need to have infrared camera. But infrared cannot penetrate clouds. Therefore, you go for microwave. Microwave E is equal to H nu, the energy is so less, therefore you cannot put it into a geostationary orbit. If you cannot put it into a geostationary orbit, you can put it only into low earth orbit. If you put only into a low earth orbit, it will see India only two hours a day. So that means we require 12 satellites or all the countries should cooperate and say that we will all sign an agreement. You give your data, I will give my data. That's what we are doing. That is the GPM. So that is the global precipitation mission where there will be one uh, mother satellite, there will be children satellites. All the countries will sign an agreement, then we'll share data, and eventually we'll be able to get an accurate estimate of what is happening, the clouds, the rains, the monsoons, the cyclones, and so on. Okay. So this is only the tip of the uh, uh, iceberg. We, there are millions of exciting stuff in mechanical engineering. So mechanical engineering is forever exciting. Whoever wants, please come and be a part of this excitement. Thank you. <laughs> You have any questions? Please ask questions for which I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, that launching button, me. No, no, it's basically the various sequence, right? So once, first you have to cross the 180, 30 kilometers, 80 kilometers, 150 kilometers, then there will be a trajectory, then, then there will be telemetry control. Hang on, there will be telemetry control at Hassan where you can give telemetry signals and you can, you can make it change its track and then at, at regular intervals of time you will say this stage will, fourth stage will separate, third stage will separate and so on. But the GSLV has to have you are taking it to 2000, you are taking it to 36,000 kilometers. Therefore, it has to be heavy. Therefore, the fuel tank, everything is heavy. So, if something goes wrong, there is enough chance for GSLV to fail. Are you getting the point? Because you are, and then, apart from the fuel and all this, you put the satellite also, isn't it? In fact, you can have a nuclear warhead also if you want. <laughs> yeah, there, there. Last question. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's a good question. But the hope is eventually these uh, satellites which are pushed into the graveyard orbit will hit some meteorite and some debris will fall over the place or debris will, fall, will be there in the, in the space. Now we are not worrying. So we are pushing it into 45,000 foot. That's agreed internationally. US, USA, USSR, Japan, India, all of, all of them are... Uh, that's a good question. But many things, many satellites which are pushed to the graveyard orbit will eventually hit a meteorite somewhere and they will just crumble into pieces. Okay. We thank uh, Professor Balaji <laughs> for an excellent lecture. And on behalf of the organizers, I present a small moment to them.